Hey, everyone. Welcome to Episode 5 of Ask the Howlers, our cybersecurity expert roundtable. Thank you to our returning audience. This is our fifth episode. Uh, we do this series bi-weekly. We have two esteemed guests joining us today. If this is your first episode, I want to take you through on our next slide here what we like to do during these sessions. Um, so when there is relevant threat news, if there's a latest threat, we will have guests on talking about that, talking about ways to mitigate and detect it. Uh, we talk about expertise from across our Howler database within VMware Carbon Black, and the Howlers comprises a team, not only cybersecurity experts, but evangelists who outside of their normal day jobs spend a significant amount of time uh, not only speaking on behalf of Carbon Black, but doing research behind the scenes, making sure that our teams and ultimately our product are up to date as it relates to the latest threats. Uh, and when we do these sessions live, we love to get Q&A feedback. This one's being recorded, so we ask that in your show notes or on social media, uh, reach out to us. We are always looking for ways to improve the programming. So if you have questions, you have thoughts about how we can make this session better, topics that you want to discuss, please send that information our way. With that, I want to introduce you to our guests for today's session. We have Benjamin Tedesco, Senior Client Solution Architect for VMware Carbon Black. Welcome, Benjamin. How are you today? Hey, thank you. I'm doing fantastic. Great. And Mr. David Balcar, who many of you have seen speaking across the globe on behalf of VMware Carbon Black, serves as a solution engineer for VMware Carbon Black, but both of these gentlemen, key members of that Howler team that I referenced earlier. So David, welcome. How are you doing? I am doing awesome as well. All right, and so we have a quasi-internet celebrity with us today in Benjamin Tedesco. And, and Ben, I don't mean to embarrass you and put you on the spot, but a few years ago, you were on vacation in Vienna with family, and you were able to spot an ATM skimmer. You recorded that on your phone and then posted that to YouTube, Reddit, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the various platforms. And if you combine all the views, um, there are probably millions of people have seen that information by now. In fact, it occupied the number one spot on Reddit for a good portion of the day when you found it. Um, I thought that was incredibly interesting uh, because at the time ATM skimming was a hot topic in the news. But take us through that day, take us through the reaction that you got. I'm, I'm curious, you know, a few years later, what your perspective uh, on that moment in your life was. Well, <laughs> thank you for that. I appreciate uh, the time. Yeah, this is a, uh, it was really one of those times when I was with my family and by, I guess I'd say exercising good, regular, frequent IT hygiene and security awareness, uh, it really protected me and hopefully the situation was able to protect a lot of people. I mean, we were <laughs> on a short layover in Vienna on our way back from a vacation in Italy and my wife wanted to go look at some souvenirs in a souvenir shop. And we always try to use credit cards when we travel, just it gives you a little bit more protection that way through the insurance as well. It's easier to reverse charges. And for whatever reason, the vendor wouldn't take our credit card. And so we had to actually withdraw cash from the ATM. And you know, I was just, I actually was reading a, uh, an article on a blog about a guy who found an ATM skimmer in the Philippines about two weeks before we left. And so this was fresh in my mind. And I, I'd say actually, well, before we even get into actually me finding the skimmer, you know, one of the things that really protected me and hopefully it will serve the audience here is to always be aware, always be learning, always be trying to keep a pulse on the security landscape out there. Because honestly, that's what, it was that practice that was kind of laid the groundwork to actually help me from not encountering further difficulties and actually being, being caught here. So I read an article about these ATM skimmers. And so I sort of was able to apply some of the lessons I learned in that article as I began to encounter this device. So I went in, you know, the first thing I did was I was about to put my credit card in the slot or credit card, uh, ATM card in the slot. And the first thing I thought of was, wait a second, you know, I've, wouldn't it be crazy? I read this article, so I just went and gave it a tug, and it shifted a little bit, and I was like, uh, I'm probably not supposed to do that. <laughs> um, and then I looked, and I saw the little bits of residue of glue, and I was like, wait a second, this looks relatively suspicious. And of course, I gave it a harder tug, and it popped right off, and it just, 
my jaw about hit the floor when I saw that. I was like, oh my goodness. It looked, it was a, an exact replica. It actually looked like a, um, an actual bezel that was covering uh, a standard ATM uh, card port. Um, yeah. However, it, they obviously they had repurposed it and added some additional hardware in there. So I, I put it back onto the uh, ATM and made sure no one else used it. Got out my camera phone and <laughs> I've actually gotten, I, throughout this process, I've learned that you're not supposed to video, <laughs> you're not supposed to take vertical videos on the internet because believe me, you'll get <laughs> by for that. <laughs> so I next love time how I, that's the main takeaway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you ever get a, have a chance to film a, a viral video, make sure you use the, <laughs> if you film it for horizontally. Uh, that would be my, one of my number one takeaways from this. <laughs> anyway, so, so I, I filmed, I filmed the, uh, the skimmer and I filmed kind of showing it off or whatever. Then my very next thought was, Oh my goodness. What if these guys are watching me? Because in the article I read, I it was talked about how some of these can have GPS locations in them or the, uh, the actor is nearby to receive the Bluetooth transmissions or obviously they have a vested interest. And so we, went ahead and so I was relatively nervous about this. I looked for a police officer, couldn't find one. It was on a weekend, it was late at night. I didn't have a cell phone, I didn't know how to contact the authorities. I didn't want to just throw it away because I didn't want the actor to receive it. Um, so I went ahead and <laughs> ran actually to a, a deli right across the plaza. And the idea was to basically create a makeshift Faraday cage. And so I, uh, for those of you who don't, and so I went and asked for some tin foil, and the lady, you know, I'm speaking English, the lady doesn't speak English very well. She looked at me and she's like, "Do you want it for drugs?" I was like, "No, I don't want it for drugs." <laughs> so I got it, wrapped it in tin foil, and basically I had eyes on the back of my head um, the whole time. And again, I was looking for police officers, couldn't find any, um, and so it, yeah, it was one of these situations where I had to try to figure out the best thing to do without you know, obviously uh, with very limited resources at the time. And what was the end result? Did you ultimately get in touch with law enforcement? Did you lead to the did. Yeah, so I did. Yeah, so I, I reached out to law enforcement um, and it, they basically said, what are we going to do with it? It was uh, honestly a rather surprising, um, uh, a rather surprising answer. But they basically said, well, I mean, I'm grateful that you took the video and hopefully it will ra raise awareness. And honestly, the only reason I took the video, <laughs> I, I wanted to show my grandparents because obviously, you know, I have other members of my family who, you know, aren't as involved in technology as I am. And I just wanted them to kind of be aware of, you know, that these sort of devices are out there so they can hopefully just, you know, give, give these ATMs or gas station pumps, you know, a little bit of a tug before you just blindly you know insert your card yeah perhaps no no greater video that you could have taken in, in terms of impact than one with folks you know doing a regular activity inserting their atm card into a cash machine trying to get money out realizing that um cyber uh in this case was a total physical component right not just behind the scenes coding and incident response and this nebulous concept that uh, only technical people deal with so i think that video, well, right, which in, you're in the audience, you can uh, search for ATM skimmer, right, on YouTube. It's one of the top items. Uh, and also, I, mean, I will say one other thing is kind of, so obviously, you know, I, I think most people know that my uh, primary skill set is around threat detection, incident response, things along those lines. And one of the things that we do on a daily basis is we look at things that appear good, but might have that wolf in sheep's clothing. And so mm -hmm. it's sort of this mindset of, you know, we, we are analyzing, you know, obviously the attackers, you know, love to hide in plain sight, right? You know, we're looking for those needles in the haystack. And so that's sort of the way that we need to be approaching, obviously, when it comes to technical and, uh, uh, you know, traditional threat detection IR. Yes, that's obviously where those skills are directly applied most of the time. But they also can be applied in your everyday life. I mean, I know that we want to sort of talk about uh, remote workforce and things like that. And I think that, you know, one thing I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later, but one of the primary ways that I'm seeing people targeting uh, 
our customers, but also just people in general that are working remotely these days due to the pandemic is through social engineering. And so they're trying to appear legitimate. They're trying to appear innocuous. And obviously there's that hook in the middle of that, <laughs> that worm, that bait that they're trying to put out there. Yeah. Yeah. That was, um, that was an interesting day for, for many reasons um, when that video went live. So thank you for posting it and keeping basically the world at that point apprised of um, what is a pretty ubiquitous issue. So uh, I suppose the takeaway, you know, if we're talking to cybersecurity folks right now, uh, you know, no surprise that ATM skimming is a thing, but tell your friends and family, right? And that's one of the best ways I think to uh, make the analogy of what you actually do at work and how you can um, positively influence their day when it comes to being more aware for security. Uh, Dave, let's let's bring you into the conversation here, uh, famous in other ways. But before we do that, do you have any um, stories like that, ATM skimming finding in the wild or, or anything um, worth noting, or do you want to move forward? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that was definitely a great find by Ben, that's for sure. Uh, I know personally, uh, every ATM that I'm at, I always check, you know. Um, yeah. I'm checking for uh, pads on there. I'm checking for uh, extra cameras or anything like that. Uh, gas stations as well. Uh, there's been lots of uh, skimming devices at uh, uh, gas stations. And um, I got close to grabbing one. There was uh, one not too far from me, about two miles from my house that uh, uh, law enforcement got it like the day before I went to go to that gas station uh, mm. and, and grabbed it off of there. But uh, yeah, I've seen lots of skimmers, uh, different styles. I've worked with some ATM companies, uh, doing some pen testing and whatnot. And so I've got a chance to see some of that stuff, especially from uh, law enforcement that's grabbed it, but uh, it's still prevalent out there. Um, I've also seen um, card skimmers at retail shops. Uh, there was a major retailer here in the U.S. that got hit with about 20 of 20 devices uh, around their uh, POS system. So they had to re-engineer how they attach the POS uh uh, to, uh, credit card machine directly to their uh, countertops to try to prevent that as well. And was that an was that an insider job or did it seem like a no? They had a gang. Man? It was a cyber gang that was actually doing wow. it. Work. It was a collaboration between some uh, cyber criminals and uh, some mules, basically. And uh, so they would go in pairs. Uh, usually, three to four people go through a, a cash line. One person would like cause something to fall on the ground so the the registered lady would have to or person would have to drop down and, and get out of sight where they quickly uh put their device over top of the old device uh or try to jack into it somehow and uh yeah they've had, had them on video there's some there's some videos out on that one as well it's pretty interesting, interesting. cool well shifting away from atm skimming uh realizing that's sort of a popcorn topic at least for um this discussion um so you guys are howlers, and I noticed on uh, the respective website pages uh, for your profiles, you each had a quote. And David, I'll start with you. You use this line in your email signature. I've heard you use it in presentations. Uh, security is a mission, not an intermission. And I'll allow you to reveal uh, who said it and on what platform, but more importantly, um, why do you double down on that message so much and, and how has it resonated with audiences? Uh, well, yeah, so it, it definitely it resonates. And the main premise behind it is we never take a break from security. Um, the cyber criminals don't take a break. Uh, as defenders, we should definitely never take a break. Uh, you know, you get a lot of uh, point, set and point solutions that people deploy. like, oh, this is all I need to do. And then they walk away or they don't look at alerts. Uh, look at a couple of the breaches in the last, you know, two to two and a half years. They were caused by, they could have been prevented. They, people saw the alerts and just didn't do anything about it. So that's my main premise is really, uh, you got to be vigilant all the time and uh, never take a break uh, from uh, security. And the actual quote came, uh, go ahead. Yeah. I was asking who it was from, so go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the quote was actually from Paul Blart uh, as a fictional character uh, in a movie that Kevin James played. Uh, he was a mall cop, and uh, that was one of the sayings that he said was uh, that he never takes a break from securing the mall. Uh, so I think that's – and he was not only – he was the defender of the mall, right? So he was protecting all the businesses. And uh, so that's – it really resonates. 
Yeah, and and Benjamin, your your quote a little more literary than say Paul Blart, but uh, no less effective, right? So it's a little bit longer. But there's no such thing as a new idea. It is impossible. We simply take a look, take a lot of old ideas, and put them into sort of a mental kaleidoscope give them a turn and they make new and curious combinations, keep on turning and making new combinations indefinitely. But they are the same old pieces of colored glass that have been in use through all ages. And of course that is Mark Twain. Benjamin, how do you feel that concept relates to security uh, as it stands today? Yeah, um, well actually I, the context of me really falling in love with this quote was when I was putting together my master's presentation on just a, a strategic threat hunting model and the need for having some, you know, a comprehensive step-by-step -step process that can be used to uh, focus and direct uh, threat hunting efforts. Um, you know, we've all heard, you know, the quote from the Bible, you know, there's no, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And so as I've been looking at this and whether you're looking at ATM skimmers or you're working on security, uh, trying to, mature the security operations within an organization, we have a finite set of data points and tools to work with. And the job of a threat hunter is really to take the same old, same old things that we see every day and to look at it differently. And I, I feel like that's how a lot of IT security practitioners work, right? So we are trying to say, okay, well, how is an adversary looking at my security and trying to twist it and look at it differently? I want to look at it from their perspective as well. I don't, when I see a door that's locked, I don't want to see, okay, well, this is a barrier. How can an adversary see that as an opportunity? You know, when I see all these logs that are coming in showing performance data or logins, how do I twist that? How do I, you know, cause relevant data to bubble to the top that someone else might not see that also might say, oh, wait, that could be an indicator of intrusion, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. And, um, you know, attackers, if there's nothing new under the sun, they, they tend to reuse and reuse ways until um, they no longer work and then they have to invent a new one. So I think it applies on multiple levels. Uh, interesting quotes from both of you guys. I appreciate you putting them on the page and, and taking us through them here. Um, switching gears now, uh, work from home, right, is, is the topic. It has been the topic uh, since COVID-19 uh, became such a, such a big issue. And now we're seeing multiple states um, changing their state home orders in some cases, in some instances mandating masks. So beyond the, the political side of it, right, this stands to change or retain uh, the current work from home policies that we've seen for so long. And because of that, security has had to shift, particularly when it comes to uh, SOC operations, incident response, um, so, so Benjamin, we'll kick to you again here, right? Given the current climate, uh, given what you've seen in the last few months and, and what you expect, um, how has security changed as a result of work from home and, and how do you expect it to continue uh, for the rest of the year and beyond? Yeah, so I mean, there's two primary ways that I've been seeing a shift in the industry. First of all, there's been the architectural shift from on-premise to the cloud. We have now a lot of organizations trying to figure out, well, how do we, number one, support rem a remote workforce? But then part of that support is how do we make sure they're secure? And so this has provided a, a natural migration to the cloud where either companies now are having to say, okay, well, how do we, you know, punch holes in the firewall? How do we upgrade reverse proxies? How do we, you know, throw a lot more infrastructure at various network appliances and then obviously that requires support and that's a fairly intensive process. Because then you also need to <laughs> hire and ensure that you have the appropriate resources to maintain and manage these appliances, devices, controls effectively. Or this has also provided justification to say, well, you know, what? honestly, we're <laughs> kind of done with this kind of older model of, you know, having on-prem security appliances and having to funnel everything through it. Let's, let's use a cloud-based solution. And so this is where we're seeing the rise in, you know, these SaaS-based NGAV, EDR products, things like that. Um, so that's been the first major shift as far as just how to 
support and secure remote people, a uh, remote workforce at scale. Um, <clears throat> the second one that I'm seeing is actually a whole lot more uh, attempts at social engineering. So I was reading the other day, and actually I experienced this, um, you're getting cold calls from either someone in the office, from a recruiter, from a salesperson, from someone in HR, you know, the, the vectors can be endless, but basically it, it starts out typically with a phone call. Most people realize that if you get a random email, you're probably not going to trust it. However, I've been seeing a lot more personalized uh, methods of trying to sort of cultivate that trusted relationship with an intended target. So usually a phone call, you know, I saying, hey, you know, would you be interested in this? Or can you, you know, go ahead and pass me along this? I actually received a phone call where someone was saying, do you mind, this is an interesting opportunity uh, related to uh, some sort of sales uh, opportunity. Do you mind sending an introduction email to someone else? And again, it, it could have been legitimate. Uh, it, there is a, a few things that kind of caused me to be a little bit suspicious. Number one, because I was <laughs> completely the wrong person to be asking to make an introduction. Um, but we're seeing a lot of social engineering uh, being targeted to individual workers that are sort of outside the bounds of traditional monitoring and don't have you know, a coworker right across the cube call to say, hey, listen, did you really do this? Should, is this something I should do? So people are a little bit more on their own island right. from right. a control perspective as well as on their own. So, yeah. Uh, David, I suppose same question to you with a little more future looking tone, right? So the, the future of work has been a topic that's um, been in the news a lot. A lot of companies are figuring out how they're moving forward. What do you think the future of security looks like. Benjamin mentioned, of course, that shift from on-prem to cloud, the evolution uh, of attackers who are in, in many ways reusing social engineering, but uh, targeting it in more direct ways. Do you have a perspective on what the future of work and the future of security looks like amidst COVID? Uh, yeah, and I, I'd always almost preface it by saying, look at the past, right? If we go all the way back, Roman times, and uh, you know, you got the Trojan horse and you have all this stuff, it was just a new tactic for the time, right? So the times are changing. It's the same premise of getting to you and your information or uh, getting information changed or stealing money. You know, uh, scammers have been doing this for quite some time where um, I've seen them call, uh, and I've personally been involved in incidences where they've called the uh, CFO and says, hey, uh, I, I'm the CEO. I need you to transfer $200,000. There was one uh, just happened last year where they used a deep fake. They uh, copied uh, one of their, the, the president's uh, voice and did a voice uh, deep fake against the, the CFO to transfer a couple hundred thousand dollars. So that's really scary. That's one thing that would keep me up at night for that kind of stuff. Um, you really gotta get some, some multi-factor authentication against that. Say, like, oh, that's great, but uh, what's our secret word for the day or something, you know? Uh, I was in the U.S. military, and we changed, you know, like encryption codes every single day. So uh, I, I recommend that to people. Make sure that it's not just a, a code or, or something, something that we can, you can verify quickly or, hey, I'll call you back, you know, kind of thing at a good number. So uh, even if they're trying to call you and do those kind of scams, it's uh, a good idea. So, yeah, let me call you back. So uh, I, I, I do reference a lot of people over here. There's a guy on YouTube that does a really awesome job of this. Uh, Jim Browning, uh, he attacks scammers. I mean, he goes after their call centers and uh, right. he alerts victims. It's really, really awesome stuff to take a look at. Um, but yeah, I think as far as the future, it's, it's not getting better, uh, that's for sure right now. And I think it's gonna take a collaboration between the defenders, telecom companies, being able to uh, shut some of this stuff down as well, uh, for sure on that side of the house, then you got the IT staff and, and totally with what uh, Benjamin was saying was, you know, you've got all this on-prem stuff and even a uh, hybrid public private cloud. How do you manage all that? Uh, some of the, the SaaS cloud applications are, are, are definitely very robust, very easy to manage. And that's, that's where people are going to have to look because, you know, the work at home, like me personally, I've worked from home for many years. So I have a lot of safeguards. So, you know, I have three networks in my house, one just for work, one for my honeypot network and one for everything else. And, you know, if people are coming home, they're bringing their corporate laptop and you know what? Oh, 
that the kids want to play and I leave my laptop open. Well, what if one of the other kids comes and jumps on my laptop and starts go browsing the web? <laughs> you know, it's that, it's, it's that, I call that the insider threat, right? So uh, <laughs> you have to be on the lookout for all of that stuff. You know, I, I don't leave my, my server room is locked. My basement is locked when I'm down here. I close all my computers, make sure I log out every single time. It's, it's some good hygiene um, that people should be aware of and, and, and think about. I mean, because they just weren't thinking about this stuff uh, beforehand. You know, they just got plain Wi-Fi. I can't tell you, all my neighbors when I moved in here, they all had open Wi-Fi. And it took me about six months. Finally, I convinced everybody to put passwords on their Wi-Fi, secure it down, change their um, SSIDs to something else. So it's not, yeah. so the scammers can't pinpoint, you know, where they are. And I, I guess we'll bring Benjamin back in here talking about the, um, the consumer side of it, right? I mean, um, probably not too many folks like you and David out there have the, the technical chops to protect their server room, set up multiple networks. I mean, maybe, um, but uh, on, a, on an intro level, like 101 defending your, your home cybersecurity posture amidst COVID, um, we hear a lot of stuff like good password hygiene, multi-factor authentication, sort of the blocking and tackling of cybersecurity that we, of course, are uh, acutely aware of. But do you have any additional tips for folks out there, perhaps um, not as adept at security? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first is, is that <laughs> if something feels suspicious, you shouldn't keep going. So if something strikes you as odd, trust your gut. Um, so if you get an unusual email, you get an unusual phone call, there's an unusual pop-up that pops up on your computer, stop. You know, trust your gut. One thing that actually I have been working with other members of my family on too, you know, most of the time, you know, I'll get that call from an in-law saying, hey, yeah, there's something weird happened on my computer, you know, <laughs> earlier today or something like that. And I'll say, well, what happened? Well, I don't know. I clicked through it. It's like, well, when something's hmm. weird, stop. And one tip I'll give you actually, because most people know somebody that knows something about security. Uh, yeah. If you see something unusual on your, on your computer screen, take a, take a picture of it with your cell phone. That's something really easy to do. But then you can say, then you can show it to someone and say, hey, you know, this, this happened. It was weird on my computer. Uh, so that's, that's just a quick little tip. I mean, yes, I completely agree to use multi-factor authentication. Absolutely good high password hygiene. I know it's easy to use the same password or variations of the same password. Please spend the extra dollar to a month and get a password um, manager so you can have different passwords. Um, I know that actually Chrome or Google, and obviously there's some security issues with Google Chrome right now, but Google's actually been doing a really good job of helping users audit their passwords for duplicate passwords. But Watch out for duplicate passwords as well. It's, it's something you hear a lot, but that's that's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, gentlemen, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I want to offer an opportunity for, for closing thoughts from either of you realizing that 30 minutes is, is never enough to dig into the brains of uh, a lot of the experts we have on the team, yourselves included. Uh, but David, any closing thoughts uh, as it relates to the cybersecurity community you mentioned earlier? Um, collaboration between security and IT teams, uh, right, is a major part of this, especially in the work from home environment. Any, any tips on how to go about doing that? Uh, the biggest thing is communicate, 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 right? Uh, mm -hmm. With a lot of uh, IT teams, they were, as soon as this hit, right, they were more concerned with connectivity. Can I get my, my workers to get into the office and get do their job, right? Uh, and then you have the security team waiting. It's like, hold on a second. We've got to make sure this is secure, whether it's multi-factor, single sign-on, you know, remote apps, BBI. There's all these things uh, that needed to be accomplished. But it's also not just, can I go back? Can, can I go back and double check to make sure what I'm doing is secure? And that's where, you know, uh, like SOC teams and stuff are having a really hard time right now trying to keep up with, you know, the visibility gap. Because now, since we've moved outside the normal infrastructure and doing it, you know, remote from home, from multiple places, um, it's that visibility gap. Uh, can I see everything that's going on, on on my endpoints, whether they're at home or they're on the road or anything else, like never before? 
Benjamin, anything, closing thoughts on that? Any, any final tips beyond make sure you check that ATM um, card reader for potential shell on top of it? <laughs> uh, I think really just the, uh, the advice I'll give people is really we need to be wary and to be alert and just have that situational awareness. Um, this definitely does present uh, some opportunity for the defenders in that we have, if we're able to be flexible now, we have the ability to pivot and take advantage of some very uh, cool new technologies that might not have been available for you know, just a traditional on-prem instance. So we need to be able to view this as an opportunity and try to see how we can leverage different technologies. And honestly, one of the cool things too is now that we have a remote workforce and it's becoming more and more accepted, there is the opportunity now to hire, to not be ge geographically constrained with our hiring as well. So there's a larger work pool to, to uh, pull from, if you will. So I think there's some really good opportunities. Uh, obviously, we need to make sure that we are being vigilant as we are entering this uh, new uh, sphere of remote work being more commonly accepted. Though. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like um, both you guys are appropriately skeptical, right? As most security professionals are, but. Uh, carry a sense of optimism throughout that there is significant opportunity now to um, help close the skills gap, help use technology to um, build security into the fabric of the infrastructure rather than just continuing to bolt on technology. So um, I think opportunity is a good word there, Benjamin. So thanks for that. Uh, and thank you both, Benjamin, David. Um, this is always insightful to talk to both of you independent of a session like this. So I want to thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time. And if we can go to the next slide here, um, we have a look at uh, what's coming up next. So episode six, uh, we'll have uh, some different guests come on talking about long-term work from home, right? The security implications of that. We'll have folks on from uh, outside of VMware Carbon Black, uh, in addition to uh, at least one of the howlers we spoke about earlier. So again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Uh, to both Samin and Jackson on the back end for organizing this and making sure we uh, stay in line throughout the session. And Benjamin and David, I, I want to again thank you for uh, all the work you do, not only for this session, but on behalf of the company uh, and as Howlers. Um, it is very much appreciated by me and many others. So thank you for that. And thank you everyone for joining us today for episode five. We look forward to seeing you in a few weeks for episode six. We'll chat soon. Thank you.